Thanks everyone for joining us today. My name is Naomi Reinhartz. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the American Society of the University of Haifa. And it's wonderful to be with all of you today. Um, today's webinar is entitled Israel at War, a high level military and diplomatic perspective. Um, so we're highly appreciative that all of you have joined us for today's program. Again, we have hundreds of people joining. Last time, I think we had a total of 8,000 people who watched our webinar on Zoom, Facebook Live, YouTube, and our website. So um, we're really excited that so many people are interested in what we're having to talk about and what we're sharing with you. Again, we're recording this webinar. It will be viewable for you afterwards. We'll share the link by email in the next day or two so you can rewatch the webinar or share it with anyone who missed it today. So I'm delighted to be here today with two experts who have served at the upper echelons of the military and diplomatic arenas of Israeli society. They will share their analysis with us on Israel's current ground invasion in Gaza. As all of you know, on October 7th, um, former deputy IDF head Yair Golan was called upon to step up for his country at his darkest hour. He rushed to the scene of the Nova Festival where it would later emerge that more than 260 young people were being massacred by Hamas terrorists. Um, Yair saved many lives that day. Yair is a former deputy minister of economy and a member of the Knesset representing Meretz from 2019 to 2022. He was a reserve major general in the IDF and previously served as the IDF deputy chief of staff, the commander of the home front uh, command and commander of the Northern command. Yair, it's really a pleasure to, to meet you and to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Joining him is Dov or Duby Weissglass, who you all met a couple of weeks ago on our webinar. He is the former director general of the prime minister's office under Ariel Sharon. Um, Duby was one of the key architects of the Israeli disengagement from Gaza back in 2005. He also served as a, as a diplomatic delegate for negotiating with U.S. National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, as well as U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell. Today, Duby is chair of the executive committee of the University of Haifa, and it's a pleasure to work with him. Um, Duby, welcome back, and thank you again for taking the time to join us as well. Thank you very um, much. Thank you for all your efforts. Of course. Uh, before we start, I want to take this time to let you know a little bit more about us, about the work of our dedicated University of Haifa community. Um, all of us continue to strive to fortify and support both the home front and the front lines during this very harrowing time in Israel. For those of you who are looking to give back and to help us during this time of urgent needs in Israel, um, University of Haifa and ASUH are offering a few impactful opportunities with hundreds of our students, as well as many of our faculty and staff being called upon for a reserve duty. The university is, of course, unable to open. Um, so in the meantime, we're providing emergency scholarships to students who have been called um, up to reserves as part, as part of a special emergency fund. And with your continued help, we hope to keep increasing this support to our brave student soldiers, as well as our faculty soldiers. Um, additionally, the University of Haifa's uh, President's Emergency Fund provides relief for the people of Israel who are most in need at this time. Your donation will help us to strengthen the resilience of our community, providing relief to families who are displaced from the South and throughout the country. We've opened our doors and our dormitories on campus to many, many families who have evacuated from the war zones, and we're offering them living stipends, mental health support, um, food, um, ways for them to sort of disengage from everything going on with their kids. Um, and we're hoping to continue offering that support um, as long as they need it. And finally, we're partnering with an IDF association in Israel uh, to purchase and deliver equipment to IDF soldiers in the Golani, Givati, paratroopers, and reconnaissance units. Um, again, we thank you for your overwhelming generosity so far, which has enabled us to provide life-saving equipment for our brave soldiers in the IDF. Together, we have been able to purchase hundreds of ceramic vests, as well as cutting edge portable ultrasound devices for frontline MASH units. Uh, to contribute to any of these funds, you can visit our website at asuh.org slash donate. Um, and we'll put that information in our um, chat as well. Um, finally, without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome Yair Golan and Duby Weissglass to all of our listeners today. We will have a dedicated Q&A section at the end of this webinar. So please start putting your questions and comments for Yair and Duby in the Q&A box. Um, if you're on Zoom or in the comments section, if you're joining us live on Facebook. And again, for everyone joining us, please put your name, uh, where you're calling in from today, and your connection to University of Haifa 
in the chat because we'd love to know who you are and how you um, came to this webinar today. So um, let's begin with Zuby, who will um, start with questions for your ear. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Naomi, and thank you all, and welcome. We do appreciate uh, your time and your willingness to listen to us. And of course, I have the privilege and the honor to host uh, uh, General Yair Golan, uh, who is now, after a long, eventful military career that very few of the IDF officers uh, uh, ever been. And of course, out of his vast experience in these issues, he will share with us his assessments and, and, uh, and his ideas about what's happening on here. But what I would like to start with, uh, Yair, with your permission, is, you know, many, many, actually most of the Israelis were thoroughly impressed by your activities on this horrifying day of October 7th. But the, so many numbers of life that you have uh, uh, rescued. W what compelled you to respond, to act, to operate the way you did on October 7th? And what made you able to save so many lives? Well, not so many. Uh, eventually, I, I took out of the combating zone about six uh, guys uh, out of the Nova Festival. Uh, well, you know that's the that that's the nature of legends. You know they become bigger and bigger from day to day. But eventually, it was six guys. That's all. And I think that uh, what compelled me to do it. Well, it's quite simple. I'm a long time soldier, and I still feel like a soldier in a way. And um, at that morning, I felt that I cannot stay at home, uh, that I need to go down to, to the south and understand what is happening there. When was uh, the first time you become aware to what's happening? In around, around, I would say around the 8, 8.30. And I went straight away, away to the headquarters of the Home Front Command, uh, previous, previously, uh, a place where, which I know very, very well. Uh, on the way to the south, uh, the commanding officer of the Home Front Command um, was an officer. Uh, well, I provide him, I gave him his uh, officer ranks. So I know him for many, many years. So I asked him to be his personal envoy to the south. And that's what I did. Uh, I tried to help, you know, in the in the in few um, combat scenes uh, in the south. But I realized that the, the soldiers and the officers there did a remarkably good job, and they managed to kill all the terrorists. Uh, well, under you know heavy cost. But then I got a phone call from my sister, and she asked me whether I can evacuate from the the area. Uh, certain guys that are trapped uh, in between, you know, uh, terrorist fire. Uh, so I asked us, please send me a location. And I look at the location I, and I told myself, all right, it's, it looks reasonable to go there. It's a reasonable risk. Uh, I have, I think, still good senses uh, of, uh, of a soldier. And it was, since it was reasonable, I went there straight away. And in fact, it was easy to find them. Uh, they hide uh, between the bushes. Uh, so I jump out of my car. I call them over and over again. This is General Golan, you are safe. You can come out, out of the bushes. And that's what they did. I have to admit they were very, very happy uh, and quite shocked. And uh, that was the first, uh, my first tour to the, to the combating zone. And then I got another phone call and the same procedure as well. And then for the third time, and what I can tell you that, uh, you know, uh, while remembering this terrible day, I would say that I never saw so many casualties, so many fatality, fatalities in one 
seen like uh, in this uh, terrible day. Uh, it was devastating. Young people spread all over the road um, with, you know, in between them, many terrorists, the bodies of many terrorists, uh, really, really terrible scene. And I can tell you that what I understood at that time, that the chaos is so huge that anyone uh, need to do its best in order to do something positive, in order to lessen the chaos. And eventually that's what I did. Uh, all over this day, I tried to provide from the, from the scene uh, as much as good um, a picture of the, the, the combating scene to explain what is happening there, to explain what are the needs, the, the operational needs, uh, you know, very near to the border. And hopefully it helps a bit. But I can tell you the following. What I did is not a matter of heroism. Uh, if you look for heroism, you need to go to the kibbutzim, to the villages, to the towns, to Sderot and Ofakim, uh, to the simple soldiers, to the uh, officers, and to the policemen who fought there, uh, to Magen David Adom guys that uh, did a remarkably good job. Uh, there are so many stories of bravery and I can tell you, I got so much inspiration out of what I saw uh, in the different combating scene. So I think this is the this is the issue. This is the story. This is the true story. I got much much publicity because you know I'm a major general and people know me. But this is this is the only unique. This is the only uniqueness concerning my personal issue. Uh, the real. The real heroes are those uh, kibbutznikim, those people who live in the kibbutzim, who fought so well and in many cases uh, paid their lives to save uh, their comrades in the in the kibbutzim. Uh, this true story are, you know, the policemen in Zderot and Ofakim who fought and in many cases got killed. Uh, while trying to save the lives of uh, their hometown uh, people and so on and so on. And now the true heroes are the survivors of this terrible experience. Uh, they are really heroes because they, they are so, um, they are so um, determined to rebuild their homes to rebuild their lives, to rebuild their communities. And if it's, there's something I can ask you to do is to be part of this recovery process. It's a long process, it will take years, but I would say that uh, from a national perspective, the ultimate national goal for the, for the following years, for the next decade is to help uh, to recover this beautiful region of our country, of our beloved country. And I think that any prime minister, any government should put, should put it as the first priority in, uh, among you know, our national priorities. Thank you. Uh, Yair, what's your assessment of the current situation of our forces who are on the ground in Gaza, where, where, where it stand? And secondly, what do you see, what is the link or the relation between the current situation of the military inside Gaza and the attempt to release the hostages, the, the, those people who were kidnapped by the uh, Palestinians? Well, we need to admit that although uh, the operation in the northern part of the Gaza Strip is very successful, and I think that the IDF is doing a remarkably good job 
very uh, professional and uh, really something to admire. Uh, we need, to, we need to, to admit that we cannot finish Hamas by operating only in the northern part of the Gaza Strip. We need to admit that it it's could be extremely complicated to fight in the southern part of the Gaza Strip since uh, it's so, uh, it has such a dense population. Uh, we need to remember two million people uh, are concentrated right now south of the Gaza Creek. Uh, and this is almost impossible to maneuver there right now. Uh, so, and the third issue is that we need to solve the issue of the, of, of the hostages. Uh, so I guess that we will see some sort of uh, a pause uh, in the war fighting. Uh, and during this time, we need to do the following things. First, to free up all our hostages. Uh, second, to deal with the humanitarian problems of the Palestinians in the southern part of the Gaza Strip. And thirdly, uh, to ensure that no recovery process will be held by Hamas, by the military wing of Hamas. And this effort will take time. I assume few weeks. And, but the war against Hamas and the war against the jihadic Islam in uh, the Gaza Strip will last for the next few months, maybe years. So it's not something you start and you finish. It's not the six day war. It's not the Yom Kippur war. It's a long lasting military effort uh, combined with a diplomatic effort and economical effort and, and the um, um, uh, infrastructure effort uh, in order to bring something positive for the state of Israel, from the citizens of Israel, out of this war. We need to define what are the goals of this war. And unfortunately, I would say something political. I don't see uh, that this government is able to define a true goals for this war uh, in uh, which will stand uh, with this interest, the ultimate national interest of Israel. Unfortunately, um, I would say that uh, our prime minister today is mainly concentrated on his political destiny. Uh, and this is very, very problematic. So I would say that there is a strange combination between the military goals of the war and the political situation, the internal political situation in Israel. And we need to take it into account, you know, as, as observers and of course, as the citizens of Israel, uh, we need to, to think uh, what comes first. So maybe between the end of the first phase of the war and the second ongoing attempt to block uh, the Gaza Strip from further uh, building up process uh, for the military wing of Hamas. Uh, maybe during that period, we need to restructure our, our political system. Uh, in this context, assuming that uh, the IDF will succeed in in uh, dismantling or uh, even uh, um, exterminating Hamas, and Hamas is not there anymore, who do you think should fill in the vacuum? You know, Gaza is almost two and a half million people. A government of any kind is is an essential need. Who do you think uh, would be the best? From the Israeli, of course, standpoint. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would like to say that the best option, which is not a fantastic of option, is the Palestinian Authority. But I, I don't believe 
that the Palestine, that the PA will come into the Gaza Strip uh, right away. It will take time. They have no intention to be back in the Gaza Strip uh, on the shoulders of the IDF. So I would say the following. First, we need to establish some sort of uh, international mechanism combined by Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, uh, the United Emirates, the United States of America, the Canadian army, I don't know, some sort of international force to take first responsibility for the situation in the Gaza Strip. Uh, maybe it could be held by the UN, I don't know. This is something we need to explore. And I hope that there is someone in the Israeli govern government right now that uh, tries to shape this uh, structure, this future structure, which is so essential to take responsibility, at least for the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip. Um, other mechanisms should be uh, those forces uh, along the border between Egypt and uh, the Gaza Strip. They cannot be just Egyptian forces because they are not reliable enough. Uh, in order to make sure that no further weapon is entered through uh, the Sinai Peninsula, straight to the Gaza Strip, straight to the hands of Hamas and Jihad Islam. Uh, and at the same, the same time, we need to keep uh, some sort of a naval blockade around the Gaza Strip in order to, to, to stop any uh, weapon smugglers from uh, Egypt to enter the waters of uh, the Gaza Strip. Uh, that will be held. That will be held by the Israeli Navy, of course. And with this structure, uh, and with uh, stabilizing the situation, and of course the, the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip, the next phase is to call the PA uh, to take more and more responsibility responsibility inside the Gaza Strip. This is my guess for the next few weeks and months. Uh, after that, well, hard to say, really hard to say. It also has strong connection to the situation of Hamas in the West Bank. And uh, I would say that the challenge for Israel, for future Israeli government, is to uh, on the one hand, be in uh, a, a strong alliance with all kinds of international forces, and at the same time, uh, creating some sort of uh, um, uh, common goals with the Palestinian Authority. I don't see this government, this current government, working effectively with the Palestinian Authority, but hopefully I'm totally wrong. Uh, uh, to your best assessment, how do you think the Israeli government should deal with the hostages issue? You know, there are actually two schools of thought. One which believes that those hostages should be released, namely, or to be more accurate, should be uh, replaced immediately and practically in all cost. The other school is that in a way, to leave it now, and as much the military operation is going forward successfully, and it does, then it the buildup of this pressure, almost on a daily basis, can be successfully leveraged, maybe in a later stage, as a, as a mechanism to release the hostages. What's your position? Where you stand in this very, very painful and tragic sort of conflict of thoughts? It, this is true, Duby. It's really a uh, highly complicated and very, very sensitive. And therefore, I would say the following. The first goal of this operation, of this war, is to release all our hostages. And Israel should do any effort in order to fulfill this uh, mission as fast as possible. Um, 
I'm the first to acknowledge that the issue of negotiations is very, very complicated. And in order to do it successfully, you need to combine together military effort, diplomatic effort, humanitarian effort, and economical effort, all together. Uh, it's hard to say right now uh, what is the right, the exact balance between these four efforts, but we need to use all of them. And that should be conduct, uh, conducted by the most, I would say, stable and well-experienced group we can gather together today in Israel. We have these professionals in the Israeli society, in Israeli uh, security echelons, and we need to put them together as a cohesive group to handle this crisis uh, with all the needed intelligence, uh, with the most uh, well-experienced persons, and hopefully, uh, someone is working on that uh, in this current you know time and during these particular minutes um, this is the first goal of the war it's more important than anything else um, it's totally unacceptable to take other considerations and to put other priorities uh, because fighting hamas that could last for years. And, you know, fighting the and, and arranging the, the right arrangement for future uh, control inside the Gaza Strip and along the borders of the Gaza Strip, that's also a matter for, for days, weeks, and maybe months. So therefore, we need to make the right priorities. First priority is to release all our hostages. Thank you. And allow me, I, uh, you know, as we started with some of your very personal experiences raising from the first day, I would like uh, to ask you about your very personal experiences, experiences as of today. I know that you are dealing very intensively with those thousands of displaced people, those who lived at the Gaza border communities and in such a tragic, so tragically had to leave homes almost in a few minutes. Just sh share with us some of your personal experiences dealing with these people. Well, I can tell you it's a devastating experience. Um, I moved from community to community uh, in the hotels, uh, in the kibbutzim that hosts, you know, other communities of kibbutzim around the around Israel, um, and I can tell you it is a devastating experience. The stories are so hard, so sad. Uh, it's about people that lost the the trust in their country that lost the trust in the IDF and to recover them and to provide them a sense of security, a sense of trust, a sense of uh, believingness in the government, in the formal institutions of uh, the state of Israel. That is really, this is a real, real challenge. And the fact that I move from, you know, community to community is part of it. it it's to show that we really care, that we show some sort of empathy uh, to, their, to their suffer. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see the government visiting these poor people. Uh, no ministers, no member of the Knesset from the coalition are willing to go there. They're afraid to discuss, you know, this their terrible experience with them. It's a shame. Well, I remember uh, the late Prime Minister Sharon, and Duby knows it, you know, better than I. 
visiting during the second intifada uh, the families of the, the, the fallen soldiers and the families of those who suffer from terror events. I can tell you the following. He sat there, sadly, got all kind of shouting from, you know, the people in the room, from the family members, and he was silent. By the end of these discussions, he just, you know, managed to say, I'm so sorry, I'm with you. I feel your sorrow, and believe me, I'm with you. I identify, you know, emotionally and rationally, I understand your suffering. And this is something which is so absent in our current situation. Be there. Yes, you are, for 10 months, you behave like a prime minister of only part, small part of the Israeli society. It's your shame. But right now we are in a crisis. So go there, get out of your office in Jerusalem, Get out of your home, fancy home in Jerusalem, and go there to the communities in, uh, in Gedi, in, uh, along the Dead Sea, in uh, um, Mishmara Emek or elsewhere. Be there. Sit with the families. You need, to you need to listen to them. You need to be with them. You need to show empathy. And this is really... You know, it's really moving because while visiting any family, that's what I hear. Please show us empathy. You know, a, a soldier that served with me when I was a soldier, his son was kidnapped by terrorists. He's a good friend of mine. And... He, he came from, he, he, he was part of the, he is part of the community of uh, Kfar Aza. And I sat with the family. I heard them. And I cry with them. It's impossible not to cry. But that's what they need the most right now. If we have any sort of, you know, solidarity, if we follow the, the saying that Kol Israel arevim zelaze, then we need to be together, although it's very, very hard for some of us. Thank you very much, Yair. Um, well, I believe we could sit down and listen to you for hours, maybe for days, given these all these experiences, but uh, we are in a given time framework. So I will hand over the leadership to Nomi, and she will conduct the questions that will be posed to you by our uh, distinguished viewers and and uh, guests. I, I must add just one sentence. You know, uh, at this horrible day. October 7th, I had a 6.30, very early morning walk, uh, dog walking, as I usually does. And when all of a sudden, about 6.37, the sirens went on. And those emergency um, calls in the radio, because I had my earphones on me, it was very, very confusing, sort of very scaring, very uncertain. But the worst was when I came back home and switched on the TV, of course. Channel 12, which is the most popular uh, 12 Israel, their Negev correspondent, I mean, the guy who covers the South, his name is Tamir Steinman, an incredible guy. He stood there with his mic and he says, I'm receiving phone calls from my friends from the kibbutzim. Terrorists are moving back and forth. They try to break into the rooms. And he looks at the viewers, which of course he didn't see the viewers, and say, what, what should I do? What should I do? I'm trying to call the police. No one answers. I'm calling the army. No one answers. What should I do? 
and the anchor in the studio said, Tamir, uh, we try also to call from here. We try to call the army. We try to call the first aid services, Magen David. We try to call the police. Nobody answered. And we look at it and said, the Israeli empire, the most significant military, technological, economic power in the Middle East, in a villa in the jungle, like Eud Barak. And yet, this, this young guy stands there with his mic and he's consulting the anchor in the studio in Tel Aviv. What should they do? What should he do with the hundreds of text messages and WhatsApp messages and, 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 and calls he gets from his so many friends in, 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 in the Gaza border communities? which is 20 town kibbutzim and villages, which telling him about terrorists breaking in into the rooms, setting fire, yeah. uh, killing people. Uh, and, and, and the two don't know what to do, who to report because no one answers them. Anyhow, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Nomi, please, the platform is yours. Thank you, Duby and Ear. Um, I echo everything you just said. I've I've so many relatives and friends in Israel and and had similar experiences. Uh, one of my cousins was at the Nova Music Festival and miraculously survived by hiding in the forest for a full day and made it back home the following day somehow by hitchhiking. Um, and we all know people who, you know, unfortunately have um, lost people or who have kidnapped family members. It's impossible not to have a personal connection with such a small country and such a small people. So it's it's impossible not to be affected by by everything you're sharing. And, and again, thank you for your heroism. Um, even if you only saved six people, that's 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 a large number. Um, most people have not saved even one in their lifetime in something like this. So thank you for everything. Um, and thank you for everything you're continuing to do. Um, we have dozens and dozens of questions. So I'm gonna do my best to combine them for you to answer as many as we can. Um, for your ear, can you tell me what factors made the surprise attack by Hamas possible on October 7th? You both shared how shocking it was that a military as strong as IDF, that's notorious globally for how strong and good they are, how could they let this happen? There's a lot of different theories out there right now. Um, and I'll also add, should the eradication of Hamas be the primary objective of this current operation? Are the hostages the primary objective is dealing with Iran? The primary you know, objective, how do we deal with that, as well as the threats that are from the north, from Hezbollah um, and others in the north? How do we handle so many um, threats happening all at the same time? Thank you. It's a combination of four questions, actually. You know, <laughs> a lot you of know, questions to answer. Yeah. You know, you know it's, it's uh, after the Yom Kippur War 50 years ago, we tend to say that it's all about the conception false conception what your enemy is willing to do able to do what is uh, is true intentions and we failed terribly failed this time exactly with the same conception uh, i can assure you that by the next days, weeks, and months, while investigating this uh, this horrible event, uh, we will discover that it's all about conception, that the intelligence was, was there. But the intelligence was kind of, you know, small pieces that didn't bring, you know, together some sort of a clear picture not because it's so hard to understand the picture because our conception uh, blind us from seeing the whole picture and this is you know the conceptual the conceptual aspect but i would say the following the first scene concerning this false conception is this uh, idea that we need to um, 
to lessen the power of the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, and at the same time, uh, buying a kind of a pause in the war with Hamas by providing Hamas with Qatari money, with Qatari funds. This is something that was led by the political echelons and by Benjamin Netanyahu himself. And we need to say loud and clear, it was a false assumption. The second political problem is this notion that we can handle the conflict, we can mitigate the conflict, we can minimize the conflict, like, you know, the conflict is a kind of mechanical apparatus, and it's not. What we have in the other side are people who hate us, who are willing to fight us, and they have no intention to obey our willingness. And these two assumptions were part of the political scheme that uh, portrayed by Netanyahu, I mean, uh, while saying that, that Netanyahu always looked to the right, uh, to the extreme right, uh, and he looked at them as, as their uh, main allies, political allies, and therefore you need to pay them some sort of a political in, in political money. And strong Palest Palestinian authority, this is something very bad for the extreme right, because that could show that they are able to govern themselves. So they need to have weak Palestinian authority. And that's what Benjamin Netanyahu provided them. Uh, Hamas, all right. Hamas is weak, Hamas is poor. We put Hamas under a siege, it's okay. We have good cooperation with Egypt, so they won't be able to recover from cast-led operation and from the other operation, you know, in the Gaza Strip. So we are okay with that. And all it's needed is fewer and fewer forces along the border of the Gaza Strip and we can handle and mitigate and manage uh, the Palestinians as we like. So this is the political problem of the false perception. The military one is there as well. Uh, I can tell you the following. We didn't envision su such a scenario. A scenario where uh, Hamas take any part of our defensive system and manage to bring to the scene uh, those elements to neutralize our capabilities. And this is a shame. I can tell you this is a military blunder from the highest level, unfortunately. And I think, well, I have a full trust in the IDF and its in and in its ability to recover and to take out of this experience the right lessons. I'm not so sure about the political echelons. And this is a matter for the Israeli politics for the coming weeks and months. Thank you. Um, I'll turn to Duby for a couple of questions. I'll, I'll combine a couple again. Um, a lot of our viewers have been asking about the recent raid on the Al-Shifa hospital in Gaza, where, of course, they're saying are the main um, Hamas headquarters underneath. How do you see this raid sort of being carried out? How much um, do we know about this mission or um, the evidence of the, you know, headquarters being underneath. Obviously, there's a lot of discussion about it right now. How long could this potentially last? Um, and 
what what does the end of this operation look like? Is it possible to eradicate Hamas? What does that actually mean? How many Hamas terrorists are out there? Uh, what does it look like to have completed this mission successfully? Okay, As, so uh, with your permission of me, I would prefer to answer the second question. And the first one I will uh, forward to Yair because it's a sort of a military assessment. And of course, uh, uh, he is the man. Uh, as Yair previously mentioned, uh, we, our government totally do not have any sort of an end game or any what we call an exit plan. Because the almost the self-evident solution for the Gaza issue in the long run is to bring Gaza back into the hands of the Palestinian Authority. When Gaza, of course, is resisted, is reconstructed by the international community, by a coalition of Western countries that will have to inject tremendous amounts of money in order to build the by, by the end of the day, that can be done only under the label, under the umbrella of the Palestinian Authority. As Yair already mentioned, for the radical right in Israel, which unfortunately now is in control, though number-wise, I don't think they have 10% of the college, of, of the population. But politically-wise, given this very weird structure of Netanyahu's coalition, they are sitting next to the wheel. And according to them, and as Yair so well described, that I will really write because it's important, the Palestinian Authority is the ultimate enemy because the Palestinian Authority, in its own way, does recognize the state of Israel, agrees to have a political solution with Israel within the 67 border, which is not un totally unacceptable to the Israelis. But in principle, they are willing to enter into a political agreement with Israel. Hamas, that's why they are the ultimate enemy, because any sort of a political agreement with the Palestinian Authority means an evacuation of settlement, maybe one, maybe hundred, but there will be a pull out from settlements and for the radical for the radical Israel right, this is the ultimate scene. On the other hand, from this perspective, Hamas is a kind of a monster that we have to find a way to coexist with. Like, and you know, like a monster, uh, sometimes to kick it, sometimes to, to, uh, to, to appease it. But Hamas, given that ideologically, spiritually, religiously, and politically do not recognize Israel and will never recognize Israel, and it's the, the main core of Hamas charter is that this sacred struggle of Hamas will continue as long the feet of the last infidel. And the infidels is not necessarily Jews, it's everybody else who is not a Muslim. Continue to contaminate the soil of the Holy Land, our struggle or their struggle will continue. So from the from the radical right in Israel, <laughs> there are no issue in, in this. So the reason I mention it is because I do not see that the current coalition in Israel will agree to assume responsibility back into the hands of the Palestinian Authority. I'm speaking about the day after. And as long as this willingness is not existing, it's hard to see any viable, workable uh, solution. Thank you. Um, Yair, did you want to add to that? Well, I think that uh, the problem today in Israel, probably the biggest problem of the Israeli society and the state of Israel is the messianic radical right in Israel, unfortunately. It's not about bad people, villain people. It's about people who invested so much in the kind of redemption 
for the Jewish people. And they think they hold the, you know, the, the, the secret code for redemption. And that they should lead the way for the rest of Israelis. And through this process, they are willing and have the right to demand the, all the national efforts and even the lives of Israeli soldiers and citizens in order to fulfill the divine instructions according to their opinion or to their beliefs. So it's a kind of a tragedy. It's not about bad people. We need to feel, still to feel, you know, some sort of empathy to these people. But this is the situation. And up to now, in fact, since 1967, these people conducted most of the political violence in, 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 the, in Israel. We should remember that. Therefore, I think that in order to fix what we have today in the Israeli society, that should be an effort conducted by the whole Jewish people. We are together. I would like to emphasize that. We are together in this you know, ongoing struggle, internal struggle, in order to figure out what is the right way for the Jewish people and for those Jews who live in the Holy Land. From my perspective, we must be democratic, liberal, and pluralistic state. No other choice for a prosperous um, and stable and secure country. Uh, and we need to admit that any deterioration through the shadows of theocratic dictatorship, that could be the end of the Jewish state. I have no intention to say that I'm, you know, over dramatic in this, you know, event. Um, it's not about the drama. It's about the true story of the Jewish people right now in Israel. And we need to go back to the, to the Declaration of Independence. And we should say to ourselves, these are the principles. These are the principles we should follow. And this is the right way, according to these principles, to rebuild the Israeli society, the Israeli nation. Uh, we're coming up on the end of the hour. I want to ask one more question. Um, there's people still asking about the Al Shifa Hospital who want an answer from you, Yair. Um, you know, this is quite this is quite simple. What what we found beneath the Shifa Hospital is, you know, it's amazing. It's a whole structure of tunnels and headquarters, and uh, this is a you know. This is the way terror organization uh, is acting. You know, this is not a surprise. Uh, but I think that what is really remarkable is the very delicate manner conducted by the IDF in order to find the peers, in order to find the gateways, in order to handle this, you know, very delicate situation in the most sensitive manner. And doing that while providing the hospital the right crucial aid in order to remain in function. So I would say I salute the commanders of the IDF around the Shifa hospital. And I think they, they are doing right now a remarkably good job. I, I need to close in a few minutes. I want to give each of you um, a final word to say, um, maybe maybe by asking this question, what advice would you give to 
all of our viewers, we have hundreds, if not thousands of people watching today and who will watch this webinar later. Um, I myself know so many um, Americans who feel somewhat dismayed and I don't wanna say helpless, but frustrated by the way the media seems to you know, look unfavorably upon Israel or skew the news. I know so many people who were at the rally this past week, we had almost 300,000 Americans, as you know, in DC, uh, the largest pro-Israel ga uh, gathering in American history. There's obviously so much um, strong support for Israel among among Americans, but there's also the negative um, viewpoints and and the um, it's, you know violence and protests in the streets on college campuses. What advice would you give to all of us in the U.S. and around the world who are fighting to um, support Israel and Israel's image um, both during this war and after it ends? Um, and then we'll conclude after that. Uh, Doobie, maybe you can start. Uh, what should I say? Um, um, for many years, we are pretty much pretty used to those reactions of the world. So I don't think that in Israel we are really getting excited from uh, this mixture of anti-Israel, anti-Semitism, anti-everything. Uh, uh, it's enough to watch, honest to God, 1% of the footage we have seen in Israel, you know, in TikTok and Telegram, of what those savages have done to our brothers and sisters and, and children. So in a second, whatever is being said in the world becomes so meaningless. What we really care is that the political and the military support of the United States will continue, and so far it continues. And the White House and in general the U.S. administration has again surprised us with, the, with this overwhelming uh, uh, support. And you guys got a tremendous share in the build-up of, of, of this support. You are warming our hearts with your care, with your concerns, with your, the way you volunteer and the way to support us. And that's good enough. We don't really care what's happening in London or in Berlin. Apparently, they never loved us and they are not going to... Uh, uh, and I don't think expect them uh, to love us. We have a long, long, you know, 2,000 years of history of those... Uh, of, of those relationships. So as I said, we are very, very happy with you. We are very grateful to you. Just the very fact that here in the middle of a business day, in, in the middle of the day, so many hundred or so many thousand people are sitting to listen to Yair and, and also to myself. For us, that's what really warming my heart. Thank you for that. And that's good enough. And the, all the rest who are not with us, they should go to hell. Well, I, I would like to say thank you. Thank you very much. And in this time, we need to look to the inside rather than to the outside. Exactly. And we had, we need a restart. And we need all the capabilities, our people capabilities, and we need all the talents and all the resources in order to restructure the Israeli society. We need to admit something went wrong so badly, but we have wonderful people. You know, look at the number of volunteers right now in Israel, it's unbelievable. Look at, you know, the volunteer organization, in what a way they were able to recover, to react, to, do, to change themselves from, you know, from the very basic structure to be totally effective uh, in recovery process for and in, in providing recovery for, for the heated uh, communities. So it's really unbelievable. So I can tell you that on the one hand, uh, in these days, I feel much sorrow and suffer, but at the same time, but at the same time, I'm so proud to be Israeli in this current moment. Truly, we have a wonderful people. Let's work with the people in order to create better Israel. Thank you very much.
Thank you. I, I concur. I, I've never been prouder to be Jewish and to be Israeli as well. So I, I echo those sentiments. Thank you both to Doobie and Yair for your time today. Um, we know how busy and, and difficult it is over there right now. And, and you taking an hour of your time really means a lot to all of us. Um, thank you to our hundreds, if not thousands, I think, of viewers from around the world. Um, some of them are saying in London that they are pro-Israel, so we should care about them. And, and we do care about all of our friends and viewers throughout the, the diaspora. We have so many people who love and support Israel and um, even more so today are, are marching in the streets and doing what they can to support you. So know that you have a lot of love from all of us around the world and we'll continue to support you. We also have people in the chat saying that they're on their way to volunteer in Israel um, this month and will continue to come and volunteer as much as they can. I myself can't wait to get back there. We're hoping to do so very soon as well um, when University of Haifa reopens. So um, again, thank you for watching today. We're gonna have a recording of this webinar for you in the next day or two, and we'll share it with you by email. We'll post it on YouTube, we'll post it on our website and on our social media. We will have another webinar for you in the next uh, week or two. We're gonna continue to do these as often as we can. Um, Doobie will be back with us moderating future webinars as well. Um, yet year, maybe we can have you back in the future too, because you were definitely a, a crowd favorite today. Um, and again, for those of you who are looking to give back to Israel and to University of Haifa at this time, we're offering some impactful opportunities, which I mentioned at the beginning, uh, specifically our emergency scholarship fund for reserve soldiers from University of Haifa is the one that is most in dire need of assistance. So anything you're able to do to support us, please go to our website, um, ASUH.org slash donate, or be in touch with any of us at ASUH. Uh, to support our, our students um, who are in the reserves right now. Thank you again for watching us today, and Am Yisrael Chai. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.